Thank you. Thank you very much. Right after my book Super Freakonomics came out, uh, I had the pleasure of having uh, dinner with a guy named Danny Kahneman. So Danny Kahneman, if you know him, he's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, but he's not even an economist. He's a psychologist. He's one of the greatest psychologists in the history of the world, uh, one of the most eminent scholars in the world. And as I sat down to dinner with him, I was surprised to find out that he said to me, I, I've already read your book, Super Freakonomics. It had only been out a few days. I was surprised he would have taken the time to do it. I said, well, what did you think of it? And he said, I believe it's going to change the future of the world. And wow, I felt so wonderful. He thought this was true. But, but he hadn't stopped talking. He actually said, I believe it's going to change the future of the world and not for the better, but for the worse. He was referring to the last chapter of our book, a book, uh, the chapter on global warming. Okay? And it turned out, among the many criticisms we received on that chapter, his was one of the kinder uh, versions of criticism. Uh, basically, everyone hated what we had to say about global warming. Of all the controversial things I've said, I've said that legalized abortion is the reason that crime went down. Uh, I've argued that drunk driving is actually good relative to drunk walking, which turns out to be far more dangerous than driving drunk. It's a, so not that you should drive drunk, but if you have a choice between walking drunk and driving drunk, driving drunk is definitely the right choice to make. Uh, I've said that child car seats don't work. I've said all sorts of things to offend people, but nothing has ever had the effect of enraging people like what I said about global warming. If you go back to 19, uh, 2009, the fall of 2009, when uh, my book, Super Free Economics, came out. It was an amazing, magical time for the climate scientists. Okay? If you know anything about science, there's a hierarchy. At the very top, you've got the physicists, and then you have the chemists, then you have the biologists, and then you have the evolutionary biologists. And at the very bottom of the pecking order of scientists are the climate scientists. Okay? Now, they're still well above economists. We're down you know, even further than that. But the climate scientists are at the bottom, and they'd always had to accept that. But things had changed. The world had come to understand that the, the, the globe was getting warmer, that mankind was almost certainly responsible for it. There was scientific consensus. There were documentaries like Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, one of the most successful documentaries of all time. And suddenly, the world had come to believe that it was time to do it something to change. Okay? And the climate scientists were at the heart of all of us. At the Copenhagen meetings to discuss global, you know, climate change were going to be the moment at which the world changed course. Everything was going to be better. Because the answer was the only way to save the planet was to stop producing so much carbon. Okay? And the world leaders had pledged that they would come to an agreement and they would stop producing so much carbon. And we would be on a path to a better world. Well, it turned out that that meeting happened and nothing happened, that nothing came out of it, okay? that no changes happened, that since that time you can see almost no measurable impact of anything by government, by people actually dealing with climate change. And the thing that made everyone so angry when we published Super Freakonomics just a few months before the Copenhagen meetings was that's exactly what we said would happen. Okay? But you didn't need to be a genius or a rocket scientist uh, to know that nothing would happen. Indeed, almost any economist could have told you the same thing because the basic premise uh, of, of, of fighting climate change was one that economists knew couldn't work because it was based on the idea that people were good and people cared about other people and people would make big sacrifices for other people. But if there's one thing that economists have learned over time, it's that that's not really what people are about. That people more or less are self-interested and they more or less do what they were doing yesterday. And it was very unlikely that governments or people would change their behavior radically. But this isn't really uh, a story. I want to tell you a story really about climate change. What I really want to tell you a story about is about conventional wisdom and about ways of thinking and about how even, uh, uh, even you know, big groups of scientists can become confused, in a sense, about what the question you really want to answer is. The reason the Earth is getting so warm is almost certainly because we're producing so much in terms of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide. And so it stands to reason that the solution to the problem 
would be to produce fewer greenhouse gases. Okay, here's the problem. We love greenhouse gases. We love the things that produce greenhouse gases. We love the things that we drive and we love the things that we eat. Uh, and it's an intrinsic part of our life. So to change uh, what we produced would cost a lot of money. By the estimate of one economist, uh, the idea was it would cost about $1.2 trillion a year to change our behavior in order to produce fewer greenhouse gases. Okay? So about maybe 2% of the world's GDP is what it would take. Okay? That's expensive. And not just one year, but every single year, essentially to the end of time. Okay? The other problem with affecting greenhouse gases is that uh, it's probably too little anyway. Even the, the, the discussions that were talked about, if this is a real problem, weren't going to have a very big impact on the world around us. Okay? The third thing is it's probably too late. Okay? If you really think we have a problem, when you produce greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide in particular stays in the air for 100 years. Okay? When you put it up there, the half-life is 100 years, I should say. Okay? So even if you start changing things now, the benefits aren't even going to come for 50, 60, 70 years. Okay? So even if the best intentions happened, we wouldn't begin to cool the earth. Even the most optimistic uh, uh, appraisals would be 50 years before the earth started to cool. Okay? So one of the things I came to understand about climate science is it's only really half science. Okay? That the people who go on to be climate scientists, they start as environmentalists. Okay? And they bring with them almost a religious fervor to the idea about climate. They believe that there, there, there are things. And I got to thinking, well, I'm an economist. Okay? I don't know much about religious fervor. Okay? I don't know anything about climate scientists. Is there something I might be able to say about global warming? And as I thought about it, uh, it struck me that uh, it, it really economists had at least three things to say about global warming. The first is that uh, if you think about progress, think about how, think about your, your cell phones, think about your computing capabilities. There is progress. There's enormous amounts of progress in areas in which we invest. Okay? If the real dangers of global warming are coming 100 years from now, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, expensive to try to fight global warming now, it might be cheap in the future. Uh, one of the stories we tell in Super Free Economics is about the biggest problem that cities had in the late 1800s was horse manure. Cities were overrun with horse manure, with horse carcasses. Uh, they were convened, you know, meetings like the Copenhagen meeting were convened where people would say, how can we rescue our cities from all of the horse manure? Okay. Well, it turned out that the rescue came in the form of cars. We didn't do to radically overhaul what we did with horses. We didn't need to you know, uh, feed the horses less. We didn't need to have fewer horses. We just needed to have cars. There was a technological solution. Okay? So economists in general say, don't do anything today because we're always going to be better in the future at doing whatever we do today, so hold off. Okay? On the flip side, uh, economists uh, have a unique understanding, I think, of risk. Morgan Spurlock talked about risk. Here's how we think about it. People are risk averse. And when you run through our little models, it is shocking how much we will pay to avoid cataclysm. So think about an individual. So if you, if you take a typical individual and you actually work through the way people behave, it turns out that to an, avoid a 1 in 1,000 chance of death this year, uh, you would be willing to pay uh, about 2 to 4% of your income. Okay, so this is a one in a thousand chance. So this is, you know, if, I, if I offered you a bet where we would take a, a thousand-sided die and I'd roll it, and if it came up 474, I got to kill you, okay? If it didn't come up 474, I would give you something like 4% of your income. That's how much I'd have to give you to get you to roll that die, okay? And in that kind of world, you have to be terrified of global warming because what global warming offers us is a small chance of cataclysm. Okay? And that is something that economists have come to learn is very, very dangerous. So what do you do about it? Well, as I started to think about it and talk about other economists, it was interesting because all economists thought about the problem the same way. Instead of saying, how are we going to reduce carbon, we thought about it in a different lens because it isn't really, the problem isn't really carbon. What's the problem? The problem is the planet is too hot. Okay? Who cares why it's too hot? It doesn't matter why it's too hot. It could be because of humans. It could be because of the sun. It could be you know, because of you know, cows. Who cares? It doesn't matter. The question is, how do you cool the planet quickly and cheaply? Okay? Now, 
Note that I've completely reframed the problem. This isn't about the moral weakness of humans and how progress has ruined the world. It's just saying we have a problem. The earth is too hot. How do we get it cooler? Okay? And some scientists have been thinking about that problem. Okay? Now, if you remember, I said that the, the carbon solution is estimated to cost us $1 trillion a year to the end of time. Okay? But nature has actually given us a hint at another way to cool the earth other than reducing carbon. So what's nature's approach? Well, in 1999, Mount Pinatubo, an enormous volcano, erupted. And the eruption lasted for days, and it shot millions of tons of sulfuric ash into the atmosphere. In fact, it was so powerful, it shot it all the way up into the stratosphere. Okay? And it turns out that if you can shoot sulfuric ash into the stratosphere, it forms a kind of blanket around the Earth, and it blocks out some of the sunlight. Okay? So that one volcano in 1991 managed to reverse for a year all of the global warming that had occurred for the previous 100 years. Okay? And this is you know, well-known science. There's nothing, no science fiction about it. People understand this to be true. And so you know, even the, the staunch environmentalists are willing to admit that if we were willing to foolishly rely on Mother Nature to produce huge volcanoes periodically, we wouldn't have to worry about global warming. Okay? So is there a human version of these huge volcanoes? I mean, one option would be, say, to put nuclear bombs from time to time inside of volcanoes, uh, erupt them uh, by hand, and throw the ash up into the atmosphere. Now, not probably a very intelligent approach. But it turns out, how much do you need to get of the, of the, the sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere? So, so some, some of the world's best scientists, uh, guys that are, uh, led by Nathan Mirvold, the former uh, chief technology officer at Microsoft, went through some calculations. And they figured out that essentially, in order to cool the Earth, if you put sulfur dioxide high enough in the atmosphere so that it stays there, it has a tremendous leverage in getting the job done of cooling the Earth. And they realized that about how much you needed was if you had two garden hoses, okay, and you turn them on full, and the amount of water that comes out of a garden hose, if you turn it on, let it run for a year, that's how much sulfur dioxide you needed to put. One at the North Pole, one at the South Pole, and that's all the sulfur dioxide we need to cool the Earth to whatever temperature we want, essentially. Okay? So then the question became, how do you get two garden hoses worth of sulfur dioxide 10 miles high at the North Pole and the South Pole? And they thought, well, what if we actually built a 10-mile long garden hose? Okay? Which doesn't necessarily sound like it would be the smartest solution to the problem, but they figured out it actually wasn't that hard. You have special garden hoses. You have the kind of pumps that you might put into your, um, uh, your swimming pool. Uh, and you have a bunch of helium balloons. And they figured out that for about $200 million, they could build a prototype that would basically give the Earth an insurance policy on global warming. And that we could basically, for $200 million, build something which would keep the Earth from getting hotter if we wanted to. Now, a lot of, not a lot of people are saying we should begin right to today to change the Earth, but we would have an insurance policy on the future. Okay, the cost, let me emphasize again, is $200 million. Okay? I want to contrast that with $1 trillion. Okay? There's a lots and lots of zeros that get you from $200 million to $1 trillion. It's a big, big difference. Okay. I'm not sure I've ever heard of an idea that is more repugnant to regular people than the idea of building a garden hose to the sky and turning it on and starting to dial in the temperature of the Earth like we're God. Okay? The only idea that maybe I've ever heard that's as repugnant as that is the idea that we should have a market for kidneys or livers or organs Okay, which it turns out every economist is in favor of. Every economist thinks that for organ transplants, we should have a market. Why not? Every non-economist thinks it's the craziest idea they ever heard. If you want to determine whether or not you're an economist, all you have to do is ask yourself that question. Do I think there should be a market for people to buy and sell their organs to put inside of other people? And if you answer yes, then you know you are indeed uh, an economist at heart. You're an, uh, at least an honorary economist. Okay? Everybody hated that idea. It just sets people on fire when you suggest that we're going to act like God and start to change the environment. Okay? Well, it's especially repugnant, I think, because it involves polluting more to solve the problems of pollution. Right? We're actually putting more pollutants up there to offset the other pollutants we did. Okay? So these guys came up with a, a second idea, uh, one which was only slightly less repugnant 
than the idea of, of putting a garden hose to the sky. Well, they said China has a number of enormous coal generating, elect, uh, electric, coal burning electricity generating plants. And if we just found a way to take all of the sulfur dioxide and ash that they're producing in those plants, and instead of having it come out of the, the, the smokestacks 300 feet high, it actually came out 10 miles high, the world's global warming problem would be solved. So how do you do it? Well, it turned out they basically built a big balloon. Okay, they have a patent for a big balloon that just makes the ash go up into the sky 10 miles high. And so we're not putting any extra pollution in the air, we're just putting it in a different spot. And that doesn't seem to me to be quite as bad as putting the extra pollution in the air. Well, but I'm an economist. Non-economists still find that incredibly repugnant. So along came a third set of people, a guy named John Latham, a scientist, environmentalist, who came up with another idea. It's an incredibly simple idea, and it's brilliant in, in I think, many ways. What, what scientists understand is that dark surfaces absorb a lot of heat, make the earth warmer. And br bright and you know, light surfaces, like clouds, reflect a lot of the heat back into the sky. They make the earth cooler. If we could get more clouds over the oceans, and in particular, if we made the clouds in a special way that made them more reflective, we would, in a very simple way, could moderate the temperature of the earth. And it doesn't need to be a, a big share of the surface of the, of the ocean, just, you know, three or four or five percent. So what John Latham figured out, along with another guy, Steve Salter, is that you can create clouds over oceans just the same way that airplanes and the contrails, you know, when airplanes fly, they leave behind them clouds, contrails from the condensation. That the way you could leave these trails over the ocean was simply by having a bunch of solar-powered dinghies, 10,000 to be precise, and they would putter around, uh, energized by the sun, and they would throw up into the air salt water. And the salt water, the salt molecules, end up being the nuclei around which the clouds form. And their model suggests that if we had 10,000 of these little dinghies puttering around in the ocean, spraying up salt water behind them, guided by GPS, then that would be enough to completely offset all of the global warming we've seen in the last hundred and something years. Okay? And the beauty of this solution is that if you get tired of making the Earth cooler, you just call the dinghies back into port, right? Tell them to stop spraying the, sun, the, the salt into the air. It's completely reversible. Okay, and these clouds, I mean, who doesn't like clouds? I mean, this is not like sulfur dioxide we're putting up there. These are just clouds. They're natural. They don't hurt anyone. We already have lots of clouds over the ocean. Why would we expect this to affect anything in terms of global patterns? Interestingly, despite what I find uh, to be an incredibly uh, compelling argument these guys make, uh, they have had a total of about $2 million in funding over the last decade. No one will fund this project. I myself have gone to a number of billionaires, and I've tried to convince them that if they want to make a name for themselves, a legacy of saving the world, if they just had five or $10 million to put towards studies where we could actually learn whether the science behind it works when you start to scale it, it couldn't possibly hurt anyone but it would give us a quick idea about whether or not, if we want to have that insurance policy, it would be there. And I have been unable to convince any billionaire to be willing to take out this $5 million insurance policy on the globe. There's something about, uh, about the idea that if you mess with the earth, uh, people will not like you. And billionaires, when they give away their money, they want people to like them, not to hate them, even if by, uh, by doing it, they save the world. If you look at Google Trends uh, or any kind of measure of the media, there was a moment in time when everybody was talking about climate change. Okay? And the crazy thing is, it's just marching along. The climate is changing, there's no question about it. And yet no one anymore has any kind of uh, willingness to do anything about it. Okay? But we're at a point where I think ultimately as repugnant as the ideas I've thrown out today, and I probably most of you are disgusted by the fact that uh, when I could have talked about you know, something pleasant like how real estate agents rip off their clients, instead I came and told you how we should be messing with Mother Nature, I think the time will come where this will be our solution. Uh, and it will be an incredibly easy solution. And the people who do it eventually, I think, like, like with life insurance, it turns out life insurance uh, used to be repugnant to people that when people first had the idea that, well, what you'll do is you'll give me money, 
And then when someone you love dies, I'll pay you a whole bunch of money back. I mean, that's pretty repugnant too. Now, we accept it. We accept it now. But there was a time in the 19th century where people hated that idea. So here's the irony. Everybody talks about global, global warming and climate change. And the environmentalists and the climate scientists devote their life to it. But you actually had to go back and give a prize to the group of people who have had the biggest positive effect in slowing down global warming and climate change over the last two or three years. Do you know who it would be? It wouldn't be government. It wouldn't be the environmentalists. To tell you the truth, I think it would probably be economists and bankers. Well, how can that be? Well, almost everybody blames the financial crisis and the ensuing global recession on economists and on bankers, the terrible, greedy uh, acts they did that led to financial implosion. Well, it turns out the only thing that we've figured out that reduces the amount of greenhouse gases that go into the sky is slowing down the economy. So in the end, if you think about it, the economists are the one who to blame for the fact the economy is in a complete freefall, and therefore we have done more for the environment than any other group of people on the planet in the last few years. And for that, you'll have to thank us. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you very much. Steve, just one question, okay, please. Okay, absolutely. About, about another of your books. Una pregunta sobre tu primer libro, about the first book. You mentioned that, well, do you have a theory about what are the consequences that you have a name and not yeah. other name? Yes. That is, I, I would like, if you could elaborate a little sure, bit. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, in the United States, uh, there's enormous difference in the naming patterns for African Americans and for white children. Okay, almost no overlap. And in fact, Morgan does some, Morgan Spurlock does work on that in, uh, in the Freakonomics film. And there's a general view among Americans that if you give your child the wrong name, you will like, make their life terrible. Okay? Uh, so we thought, how could you study that? How could you begin to do that? And it is amazing. So in this age of privacy, it turns out the state of California gave us data from every birth certificate, every person ever born in California with their name, and the hospital and the date. And what we were able to do was to take each uh, child, each girl who was born, and then when she grew up, when she had a baby, we would take the information from her baby's birth certificate and we'd link them together. And so we had a way to understand whether or not your name you got at birth, what your life looked like 20, 25, 30 years later when you had a baby, okay? And so what we did was we said, well, let's take all the African-American girls who got, you know, white names like, you know, Molly and uh, Heather, okay, and compare them to the, the girls who got names like Shaniqua uh, or, or Jordan, okay? And it turns out, much to many people's surprise, it matters not the slightest bit, okay? So in the end, what we realized was you just, there is zero evidence that your name can affect your life at all. I mean, look at Oprah, right? Look at Condoleezza Obama. Rice, right? People think, well, what if you didn't know Oprah, you'd say, what a crazy name. But as soon as you know someone for about 15 minutes, their name becomes unimportant. And, and, uh, and so I think it's, it's, uh, it's been an interesting study because actually what we came to believe is that the only thing that a name matters for, it doesn't matter for your life, it matters for the parents standing with their friends, okay? That all of naming children ends up being, what kind of name can I choose for my child that will make my friends think that I'm really hip, or I'm really smart, I'm really cool, whatever it is you're trying to be. And so as a parent, uh, that's what you need to do. And in particular, let me just direct you. Now, I know names are going to be different in, in Mexico and the U.S., but we have a list of Freakonomically approved names in our first book, okay? And we have a bet that those names are going to become quite popular. So you will help me up quite a bit if you can name your own children off of that list of 20 names. Please do that for me. Thank you, Steve, okay. very much. Thank you.